Welcome to the Corporate Counsel Business Journal's daily podcast, In-House Warrior, with host Richard Levick, chairman of Levick, a global crisis and litigation communications firm. Good day and welcome to In-House Warrior, the daily podcast of the Corporate Counsel Business Journal. I'm Richard Levick and with me today, Ian Lipner, who is the Senior Vice President and Chair of the Practices at Levick on Cyber and Emerging Companies, and Louis Leo, who is a partner at Foley and Lardner and a consummate deal uh, lawyer in Silicon Valley. And if the two of them are joining me, of course, it's time for our weekly show, Garage to Global Justice. Gentlemen, great to have you as always. Thank you, Richard. And you can see how shy both of them are. They, they've just realized this is audio only, not video only. So the, those those signals to me of waving will no longer work on the on the podcast. And with us today, Andy Butler, who has an extraordinary story. He's a consummate uh, entrepreneur, serial entrepreneur, sits on a number of boards. And then the reason he's here today is to talk about his latest venture, which comes from the heart and from the family, Square Panda. Andy, welcome to the show. Hey, it's great to be here. Great to have you. Um, we know you. Uh, thank you so much for joining us. We know you just got back from vacation. We will not make any of our listeners jealous by telling them where you were, but do share with us your background, if you would. Yeah, so yeah. I've been a serial entrepreneur most of my life. Um, I did a brief stint after graduating from college at uh, a company called Bechtel, a large construction company, and I joined them for two years as a software programmer doing C++ programming. But the moment I walked into Bechtel, and it's no criticism of Bechtel, it's a large corporation, I realized that I was not a big company kind of guy. And so shortly thereafter, after two years, I formed my, my first company. Um, it was a company called smart tools and we did a series of electronic measuring devices got it funded and then sold it off in about four years learned a lot from that experience um you know mainly i learned you know that you know market size and tam total available market is one of the most important things you need to understand before you launch a venture which as a first-time entrepreneur i didn't really understand that so the company was not as successful as I had envisioned it to be because the market wasn't big enough to support high growth, the kind of growth that Silicon Valley um, is usually expecting from a, from a venture. Um, from that experience, I started a, a product development company called D2M, Design to Matter um, Inc. And, and that was, we were sort of an unusual product design group in that we were not your typical consultants. We looked for startup companies and we looked to play equity roles and, and board roles with those companies. Sort of the first, we were kind of before Y Combinator, we were one of the first incubators. So we incubated a bunch of companies internally and took active roles or passive roles, did most of our services for equity and had a variety of different, uh, very successful exits out of it. Um, so, you know, from that experience, um, I, I, took a, I took a kind of a, a, a right turn in my career. I'd like to call it a right turn. Some might call it a left turn. But in 2014, I started an ed tech company called Square Panda. Um, and Square Panda is dedicated to the earliest learners and the development of the most important skill they can develop, which is reading competency or reading fluency. And that was born out of my experience, my prior experience with my daughter, who's a beautiful little adopted girl from China. And was when she entered first grade, she went from being this gregarious, happy to go to school kind of gal um, to suddenly resisting and throwing temper tantrums. And uh, we did a variety of different tests on her and found out she was dyslexic. And that, that started my journey on understanding what it meant, what it means to be um, dyslexic. To me, dyslexia was, was something that had to do with alphabetic awareness and an inability to recognize you know, the alphabet. And what I soon learned um, was that it's vastly different than that and it's much more complicated. 
So without getting into those details, that's that's sort of my journey. We've been at Square Panda. Now we launched the company in 2014 in stealth mode, um, bootstrapped it all the way till we launched in 2017 into the marketplace, primarily in the US. Um, and you know, in, and then raise capital mostly from high net worth individuals. And between 2017 to currently, we've expanded to across the United States. We're in two, over 2,000 public schools um, with a subscription model early literacy platform. And in China and in India, we have some of our largest operations, and we're a second English as a second language provider. Um, servicing, you know, um, millions of children in, in India and also with a teacher training program. So that's a quick snapshot of my journey. Andy, before I turn it over to Louis and uh, Ian for a few questions here, talk to us about the moment when you went from emotional realization as father to realizing that there was an entrepreneurial there was a need and an entrepreneurial opportunity. Yeah, so I'm fortunate in that I have a wife who is a professor of medicine at Stanford. And so when we encountered, you know, the the facts that our daughter was dyslexic, you know, the first thing she did is pick up a phone and, and call up uh, colleagues over in the education department. And a, a whole revelation world opened up to us. We we realized that the leading academic institutions that, that study education and, and pedagogy are now populated by neuroscientists, cognitive scientists, who look at the neurology of learning, how the brain actually rewires itself to acquire skills. In this case, the skill of reading is a peculiar skill that we never evolved to, to perfect. You know, when you think about what differentiates humans from the animal kingdom, it's our ability to communicate as a society, to gang up and communicate and organize ourselves to attack the saber-toothed tiger and collectively, because individually we can't, we can't, we can't achieve, be successful at that. So we have very advanced oral skills, oral communication skills, but the idea of writing down those processes and techniques and skills and recording them from history that's only been around on a ubiquitous basis for the last 500 years. Writing was discovered, cuneiform writing was discovered 5,000 years ago. Not enough time for evolution to play a role in making that skill an ingrained part of our DNA. So, you know, what the people over at Stanford told us was that, you know, a shocking statistic. They said, look, you know, dyslexia is just a severe form of a phenomena that's impacting two thirds of all kids because two thirds of all the kids in the United States do not read fluently by the fourth grade. And if they don't read fluently by the fourth grade, they fall so far behind the one third that are reading fluently that they rarely catch up because the, that one third is absorbing content in all other subjects at a much more rapid rate. And so, if your parents aren't affluent and can't afford interventions like and private schooling like I could, my wife and I could, you, your fate is essentially set in fourth grade if you don't read fluently. So first of all, I just went, how could that possibly be as a society? How can, how can we tolerate that? I mean, just from an equity standpoint, that's, that's obscene. Um, secondarily, from an economic standpoint, looking forward, I mean, we're an information-based economy becoming even more so in the next coming decades. How can we tolerate that as, a, as an economic social policy? So, you know, so diving after the outrage, you know, um, I dive deeper and what Stanford recommended and what most of the centers recommended was, look, you know, the way to overcome this is intensive tutoring and which we could afford. And what effective intensive tutoring is, is you're taking a person who is a domain expert in one particular topic. A tutor who covers every subject is, you know, is okay, but the most effective tutor is one that's assigned to a specific skill set. In this case, 
um, letters, phon phonological awareness, letter sound decoding, phonemic awareness, et cetera, somebody who's been trained in all those skills. And then that person has sufficient experience that effectively as they're tutoring a child, they are doing real-time assessment on that child. They're measuring against a complex array of different skills that are required to read fluently, phonological awareness, phonemic awareness, letter sound decoding, um, sight word reading, memorization of, of auditory, you know, comparisons, et cetera. Um, they're doing real-time assessment on that child and adjusting the curriculum on a real-time basis. And that's what a high price, very educated early literacy tutor will do for your child. And by the way, my child's now 17. She's no longer a child. She reads a book a week, albeit she's dyslexic. So she reads about 20% slower than her peers, but she just works longer 20% of the time and she does just fine. But stepping back as a technologist, and I've always played the theme kind of in my background is I've always looked at conventional marketplaces that had pain points that were not being addressed, that had needs, market consumer needs that were not being addressed, primarily because the conventional companies didn't understand the breadth of technology and how it could be applied to that pain point. Um, and so this was like kind of a perfect dovetail to my past experience. I looked at it and I said, oh my God, what a tutor does will never get, will never get one-to-one -one efficacy with a a tutor who has a PhD in early literacy and cognitive scientists in co cognitive science who then tutors my child. Never get there, but we can get pretty damn close and it can be infinitely scalable and very, very cost affordable because guess what? This was 2014. Cloud storage was becoming very, very cheap. So you could put curriculum interventions up in the cloud, a lot of it with very, very specific skill set targeting. You, AI was getting more accessible. So you could do real-time assessment on the child based on their successes and challenges and understand at a deep level against the complex array of skills, how to then reach into that cloud of curriculum and apply it. And then you could gamify it because we have these wonderful things called tablets with these incredible, you know, incredible graphic interfaces and with high speed internet connectivity, you could gamify it. So you keep these little kiddos engaged. And I saw all that only getting cheaper in 2014. So I went, I can bring all these together and aggregate these and create a company around it and nobody's doing it. So that was, that's a long winded explanation of what the catalyst was to the start of, of Square Panda and how it actually you know, was very, very relevant to my past background and why I felt compelled to start this because the social need was so in, was so obvious and dramatic. Andy, that's just a great segue to my next question and, and which really is goes to the heart of our of our podcast series is how do you go from garage to global? And one of the many amazing things about you is is how you've taken this idea out of the United States and into the global stage. But but also, you know, you're, you're in the inner city and you're in the U.S. and you're also in India, China and Korea. How did you get off the ground? I'd love to hear about, you know, how you, you raised your first money into the company and, and how you brought your first product to market. Sure. Let's start with money raising. You know, it's a really, it's kind of funny. Occasionally, you know, in the past Stanford business school would invite me for a one day seminar to the biz school to talk about what it's like to be a CEO of a startup company. And I always ask the question right off the bat of, what do you think a CEO's role is? And I get these wonderful responses, kind of like, you know, visionary responses, like your role is to be the cultural leader of the company and define the culture. And your role is to set the go-to-market strategy and differentiate the company from the competitors, et cetera. I mean, all those things are important, but, you know, I, I inevitably say you're, you're all wrong. Those are number two and number three. Your, your number one goal is, your number one function is to raise money <laughs> because without that, there's no gasoline in the engine. So you're going to be spending, you know, just to calibrate your experience. If you want to become a CEO of a startup, you're going to be spending about 85% of your time doing that because that's just the, 
that's the conveyor belt that you jump on if you jump on as the CEO of a company. So, you know, relating to Square Panda is back in 2014, that was the desert of ed tech. Now ed tech is a darling in the venture capital community. And, you know, there's a lot of, there's a lot of positive momentum, but if you went out pitching ed tech in 2014, you know, you were like a comic whose one-liners just landed with a big dud and nobody clapped. You know, it was like everybody went, Ed Tech, uh, sorry, maybe you can, you know, pitch to our recent, you know, intern. You know, you'd never get to a partner level, you know. He, the intern needs to have practice listening to pitches. So, I mean, it, you know, it's Ed Tech was, I don't know, historically was started off hot in the mid 2005, 2006, there weren't a lot of exits initially, so venture capitalists lost interest. Then it's it's just in the last, you know, literally 12, 24 months that EdTech started picking up, in large part due to all the remote learning that's happening in COVID, times of COVID. So, you know, the only option available to me was to raise money with private or accredited high net worth individuals. And so that's what I did. And I, you know, constantly pitched and, and raised money. And we raised a pile of money um, with high net worth individuals. And when I tell venture capitalists how much money we've raised to date, they're kind of shocked. But I'm also, I'm not alone in that. There's other startups like Salesforce that never raised a cent of venture capital and somehow, you know, navigated the, the rocky shoals and we're able to move the, the boat forward. So Andy, what comes first, the, the fundraising or the product? Uh, and, and I think that's a, it's a trick question because it's sort of like the chicken and the egg, isn't it? Yeah. You can't have one without the other. Yeah. So, I mean, in the initial days I funded the company and I funded it, you know, partly because I was still running my consulting company. So I was taking the profits from the consulting company and pouring it into the development of this product. I was able, you know, so because without a, with just waving your hands, especially in the ed tech market, we needed, you know, that was too hard of a sale. So I knew that. So I had to have something to show. I had to show the differentiation. I had to have a business plan. I had to have a skeletal crew. So basically that was funded initially out of my back pocket. And I was fortunate enough to have a business that had ongoing profitability that could do that. Um, and then as we picked up steam, we were able to bring in one by one other investors. Um, and then you do what you normally do with, you know, when you've got a private network is you ask your investors to introduce you to other investors and you, expand outward from that. And tell me about the product development that was happening at the same time. So so tough, you're out pitching, trying to raise money, and at the same time, you're trying to build a minimum viable product and, and then something that, that you can ship to generate some kind of revenue to demonstrate that there's some kind of fit with what you're building and what the market needs. Yeah, fortunately, you know, fortunately I had a whole career about launching products and helping other companies launch products and I'd, I had scar tissue over you know over how to you know how to position your product how to develop your product you know how to make sure you had differentiation in the marketplace you know I, um, so bringing that bag of experience you know saved a lot of pain and agony <laughs> you know um, so you know we were able to you know, quickly do the things you should be doing, which is really kind of map out the rest of the market and where you thought it was heading, come up with your own original concept of it, test that as early as possible with prototypes, even though they're what we call Frankenstein prototypes, because markets don't, marketplace specialists don't respond to concepts, they respond to experiences. So you got to put an experience in the hands of the people you're trying to reach. So we reached out to the organizations that were most in the need, like in the Bay Area, we reached out to Head Start and we did a whole bunch of pilots with Head Starts with pretty, pretty basic, I wouldn't call it crude prototypes, but you know, internally in the trade of 
product design and product development, we call them Frankenstein prototypes, um, you know, because they're, they're basically skeletal representations of what you're trying to achieve. And over time, as you get more feedback, you can embellish it. And, and as you embellish it and get more feedback and you get a better you know, definition of what success looks like, you inevitably are more credible to the investor base and that brings in more money so you could advance the ball forward a little bit further. So it's very much, you know, it's, it's very much, you know, like two, I wouldn't call it two or three steps forward, one step back, but it's more like two, three steps forward and pause and, and secure your beachhead, then move forward again. Andy, tell me about your first big break at Square Panda when it, the, the, when it really clicked. You know, I, I think our first big break was, you know, is in surveying the marketplace and reading everything I could. I, I came across an individual named Andre Agassi, the you know, eight time, you know, tennis champion of, of, of majors and everything. And I read his book about his journey, about what motivated him to resurrect his career and go on and, and have one of the best later stage careers ever in tennis, except only succeeded by the current crop of players who are now playing to 39 and 40 years of age. But he was exceptional at that point. But what motivated him was his desire to bring education to the poorest neighborhoods of Las Vegas, his hometown. Um, and he actually, you know, started a charter school, you know, he writes in his book, he took out a mortgage of $40 million on, on his home and, and opened up, you know, a charter school of public, public uh, charter school, freed all the kids of state of the art school in, in the worst districts of Las Vegas. So I cold called him. Um, you know, I had no connection to him. So I cold called him, got his, uh, his senior business partner, a gentleman who was the former vice president international of Nike, um, um, a gentleman Steve, named Steve Miller. And Steve kind of g gave me the strong arm, <laughs> but I kept calling him up and finally agreed to meet with me. I pitched Steve and Steve said, okay, Andre's got to listen to you. I ended up pitching several months later, Andre, and Andre said, this is interesting enough. He goes, I totally understand and get, you know, the importance of early literacy and how it is actually the key to unlocking a child's potential, but you, you have to prove it to me. So he put our system into his school. He tested it for six months. He liked the results and he agreed to join the cause, both with his brand, his name, his network, and his money. He invested in the company. And that really, really was a turning point for the company. Um, and, and it's, you know, he, he not only gave us all the things that I just mentioned, but he also, you know, is just an incredible source of energy and also strategy. Um, most people are surprised when they hear me say that, but, Andre was known as the best problem solver on the court. He won because he outplayed chess. He chess played all the other players. Um, he's a great strategist. So he's my go-to, often he's my go-to person on strategy when we hit, you know, various forks in the road and have to make a decision. So that's, that's been probably one of, there's been multiple milestones, but that's definitely one of the milestones that has, has impacted dramatically the trajectory of Square Panda. Well, that's such a great story. I'm, I'm so happy to hear that, Andy. And it, it just, it's why we do this pad, podcast is, is um, that is, that is a story the world needs to hear. Um, the other story the world needs to hear, Andy, is, is how you took this product and this machine that you've built from, from Las Vegas to the global stage. And, Notably, you brought it to, to Asia, and I'd love to hear about how you did that. Yeah, so, you know, my previous company, we had an office in Hong Kong, and part of our, you know, incubation efforts was to help people when they had a physical product to actually get it manufactured in, in China and, and, and develop a supply chain. So I had, I have 25 years of doing business 
in China specifically. So, you know, it was an easy, you know, it was an easy, you know, assumption to make that the China market, given my familiarity and knowing the intense importance of English, it is to the business, you know, the business functioning in China, that the Chinese market would be receptive to English language programs. So we entered the Chinese market based on that assumption. Um, and we have a presence in China. It is a difficult, difficult market because my assumptions were all right, uh, correct about the, the intensity of interest in learning English amongst Chinese parents, but the competition is just insane over there. Um, there are so many companies and so much money go chasing that marketplace that, uh, you know, we, we are still there and we're still penetrating it through partnerships but uh, it's not the easiest path to go. But in developing the China market and having, you know, and also our own market, we simultaneously opened up an office in, in India, in Mumbai, India, which was initially going to be, you know, an adjunct to our software team here in the United States um, because coders are more readily accessible in India than in the United States, not, that we have, we do all of our architecture and our primary, you know, design here in the United States. But a lot of the 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 kind of the heavy lifting of the coding is now done in India. But once we established shop in India, our general manager over there um, started exploring the India market, found a whole green field of opportunity in the primary grade levels, and so we started doing pilots there and building programs. Um, we've been in India since 2018. We just launched last year, 2020, um, and we're skyrocketing in India right now. Um, it is, it is a fantastic market, and the need and the pain point there is enormous because what people don't realize in the United States is English is probably the one skill set that is radically economically transformative. If, you come from a lower caste system in India that's been assigned to sewage work for generations upon generations. If you learn conversational English, you don't have to even be fluent. You now have access to become a hotel worker. Doesn't sound like much in the United States, but you're suddenly catapulted that person from, and that family from dire poverty to middle-class life. Andy, uh -huh. uh, forgive me for this, but we're running out of time for the show, and I want to make sure that Ian gets a, a last question here uh, before we have to sign off. So let me turn it over to Ian. Your story is remarkable, Andy, and we're definitely going to have to do some follow-up. Ian? Well, I, you know, what I was interested in uh, in terms of that, that path to global is that, you know, you have both a, a digital product and a physical product. Um, and I wanted to hear a little bit about sort of the challenges and opportunities that that presents both from the manufacturing side and from finding platforms like the Apple store or working with, with organizations like Amazon and how you strategize around that, or, or at least what were the difficult questions? Yeah. So God, how much time do I have? <laughs> um, I'll try to give you the cliff notes version of that is having a physical component makes it more challenging. Um, but the reason, and in, in, in India, and in, in in India, we are strictly digital distribution. Um, the distribution of physical products is too hard, and there's also, you know, there's also a scalability issue in terms of cost and a cost affordability issue in India that we have to respect. But in the United States, we're we very much emphasize the physical components because the market respects that. We're in public schools and public school teachers, primary school teachers believe as they should believe in multi-sensory experiences using manipulatives. Learning, learning is, you know, especially the English language is a multi-sensory experience. When I reach skeptics, who question that, you know, I've often heard venture capitalists say that sounds like that sounds like hippie philosophy. <laughs> and I go, 
No, there's actually neurological science that supports that. But I'll give you a, I'll give you a, uh, an experience you can relate to. How many people, when they give a speech and they have to memorize the speech, write it out by hand three or four times, and then they lock it in. And I almost universally get, you know, the majority of people to raise their hand. I go, you just, ex you just put that memory component in multiple places in your brain because it was a multi-sensory experience. You're not just trying to memorize words in order, but you've associated it with this motor muscle control activity of handwriting. Now that allows the brain to store what you're trying to memorize in multiple areas of the brain and retrieve it faster. That is why multi-sensory is so powerful. So long story short, is in the United States, we are, we have physical components. We have both digital books and physical books. We have a physical playset that teaches letter sound components. It is challenging to do that because now you have to build inventory. You have to have, you know, warehouses to store that inventory. You have to distribute it. You have to warrant, you pro provide warranties to it. You can't be like just digital sending out, oops, you know, version 1.8 now is you know is now superseded by 1.9 because we had a bunch of bugs in it that doesn't work in the physical world and so you got to deal with all those issues and so it is way more challenging but in the case of public schools and in the pedagogy that is relevant to the united states it's a real asset and it's a differentiation for us in the marketplace in-house warrior is sponsored by corporate counsel business journal the leading resource for corporate legal executives for over 25 years go to ccbjournal.com to receive your free issue today and to listen to more episodes of in-house warrior a andy thank you so much for sharing with us and thank you for joining us on the show today it's just been a great honor and pleasure to have you and we wish you continued great success with the important work that you're doing, making a difference in so many people's lives. Well, well, thank you very much. It's been it's been a pleasure participating in it, and I I, I look forward to hooking up with you again. Ab absolutely, there's so much more to get to here. This is Richard Levick for In House Warrior, the daily podcast of the Corporate Council Business Journal. I've been joined by Ian Lipner and Louis Leo of Foley and Lardner, and of course, Ian of Levick, and our guest today, Andy Butler of Square Panda. Thanks so much for joining us, and we'll see you tomorrow. You've been listening to the Corporate Council Business Journal's daily podcast, In House Warrior, with host Richard Levick. If you've enjoyed listening to our show, please rate and subscribe to the In House Warrior on your favorite podcast platform.